Hello Tom. I really like this idea about talking about these issues in a sort of conversation style vlog format. Um, the weather's still quite nice here but it's quite windy being um, sort of spring in Sweden after all. I think one of the reasons that discussions uh, online and in fact in real life tend to end up being quite toxic is a lack of two things. I think there's a deficit in uh, respect um, where, and by that I mean you should sort of respect someone you're discussing with and assume that they're arguing in good faith and that they have reason to think the things they think and say the things they say and that those reasons aren't that they're stupid or evil or vicious. <laughs> the other thing I think that's lacking a lot and which causes conversations to be a bit toxic is, uh, is a lack of humility. And I mean both the humility into, into accepting that what you don't know, I mean that's why Socrates was the wisest of all Greeks after all, but also accepting that one's view is just one of many and that there are other views which are maybe equally valid or more valid than your own. And maybe some views are valid in some circumstances and not others and that your view is always in the context of yourself. Anyway, I think that's why conversations online and in fact in real life tend to be a bit toxic. Um, but, you know, we're not... I, I think that we both are sufficiently humble and respectful to, to make an interesting discussion out of the topics you raised. So to get to the, to the topic at hand, you... It is true that Dobshansky said that nothing makes sense except in the, the light of evolution. But I think a central point uh, to make about um, about that view is that it depends on the conceptualization of evolution to which you're referring. I think that there's there's more to evolution than just natural selection and the modern synthesis. Uh, but that's certainly something that we can uh, <laughs> get back to later. You also said that you think the human mind is no different to sort of general evolutionary biology. Um, and, and, but of course you also indicate that things get kind of complicated in the intersection between modern sociology and, and biology. And, and it certainly does. Uh, and that's something that we should also return to. Uh, so, uh, so those things um, are related to your first principle. And, and to be clear, I, I don't agree that, that, that um, human behaviour or the... Or, the human mind is as straightforward as, as regular evolutionary biology, uh, or that we can understand it using the same tools. Uh, I disagree with that, but uh, we can discuss that. <laughs> so your your second principle is that human behaviour is, is sort of best understood as a complex interplay between biology and sociology. And I can sort of agree with that, of course, but it, it's, it's rather uh, vague, and I suspect that we that we, uh, we differ in how, we re how important we regard those different components are. Um, I imagine that you perceive the biological component um, of that interplay holding the strongest uh, explanatory power, um, whereas I would suggest that um, the sociological component um, is a more useful tool for explaining uh, uh, human behaviour, <laughs> um, also something that we should, we should get back to. <laughs> So, to be honest, I don't really know what you mean by your, your third principle in passing down human behaviour from one generation to the next, independent of environment. I mean, don't behaviours always take place in an environment? Um, I mean, I imagine there being a pattern of reciprocal causation between uh, environment and behaviour. But perhaps you mean to say that you can pass down behaviours in humans even in the absence of natural selection. But I'll, I'll let you clarify that before I, uh, before I, I talk any more about uh, what you might have meant. I also don't think that, that I'm entirely on board with the concept of constraints that you, uh, that you use. Um, and certainly not the notion of um, genetic constraints. Um, and this is something also we can talk about in the future. But it seems to me that developmental systems are what make possible uh, what facilitate um, phenotypes and the generation of variation and I don't think that it's um, the right way around to think about development in that it can constrain things um, but as I say that's something that we can talk about later. <laughs> I'm, I'm not entirely sure I'd attach the social constructivist label to myself but I think in, in any case that it, 
it seems to me to be quite clear that we have some groundwork to do in exploring our, our thoughts and views on the, the biological aspect uh, that we both agree exists, the biological component of the interplay between biology and sociology in generating or explaining human behaviour, uh, before we move on to sociological analysis. So, uh, there we have it. I'm very fond of this format and I'm looking forward to, to hearing back from you. Um, I reckon you should just pick up whichever of the points I raised that, uh, that you think is interesting and let's just carry on from there.